Good evening, everyone. We're so pleased to see such a great turnout uh, here at the chapel on this rainy, unpleasant day, but then it's a very bad day for outdoor activity, so maybe that helped. Uh, it's a super privilege for uh, me in particular to uh, welcome our guests today. You know, um, Dan Colley, the head of the Center for Tropical and Emerging Global Diseases, and himself a famous microbiologist, paras parasitologist really, he and I have been doing this series together now for eight years. And for those of you who don't know, I'm Pat Thomas. I teach health and medical journalism at the Grady College. And this has been a real interdisciplinary collaboration between uh, journalists and scientists here at UGA. And it's very uh, special to us. And uh, Dr. Jose Esparza is a very special guest to me because I, I met him in 1997 when I had first excitedly quit my job to uh, write a book. I'm not sure that's a good economic strategy for others to adopt, but mm -hmm. at any rate, it was at a, a vaccine meeting uh, run by the, uh, the famous AIDS researcher, Max Essex, uh, at a beautiful country estate. And uh, uh, Jose at the time was uh, with the World Health Organization, where he was heading up their HIV vaccine initiatives. And I think we sat together at dinner or something. I really don't remember the fine details. But thereafter, he became a person who I saw at every HIV vaccine <laughs> meeting, at every visit, every Pan American Health Organization conference, every World AIDS conference, you, you name it. He was there, and so was I with my little tape recorder. And one of the things that I learned from veteran science writers when I first started in this game is that there are people who are always in the spotlight, who are always the center of attention, and who become characters in your work uh, because they have that kind of uh, uh, flamboyant uh, uh, look at me personality. And then there are other people who a science writer really, really needs. And those are the people that will talk straight to us behind the scenes and tell us when we're paying way too much attention to something that doesn't make any sense and maybe overlooking something that does. And we science writers call those people rabbis. You need a rabbi on this, people would tell me. And Jose, he was one of those people who brought me that, that wisdom, uh, that support, and that addition of perspective to my reporting for five uh, long years that I worked on my book. And it's particularly uh, appropriate that we have him here in Athens this week because, uh, some of, as some of you may know, uh, February 18th through 20th, at the Classic Center, there will be a display of panels from the AIDS quilt. I don't know if any of you have ever seen any part of the AIDS quilt before, but this, this first, uh, uh, this tribute, this handcrafted tribute to people who lost their lives to AIDS began 25 years ago, which was also the same time that AIDS Athens, our local uh, AIDS advocacy and service organization was formed. So if you have a chance, turn out at the Classic Center, February 18th to 20th. There's an opening night on the evening of the 18th. It's even in an era when we have effective antiretroviral treatments, but still not a vaccine that we're really pleased with. Um, it's still a profoundly moving uh, human experience to see this, uh, this quilt. So I hope you'll get a chance to do that. I am not reading you Jose's biography that is in the program. You can do that. And besides, he's going to talk about his life. He's going to do that now. And afterwards, I hope you'll join us for refreshments next door at Demosthenian Hall. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Pat. This is very nice. In fact, when Pat invited me to come here, she said, please also give a very unconventional uh, presentation and explain how you got involved in, 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 in this uh, uh, big challenge of developing an HIV vaccine. So I, I want to thank Pat, my old friend for many years, and my new friend, Dan Colley, uh, for this kind of invitation. Uh, it's a real honor to be here 
and to be part of a distinguished uh, series of talk. Many of the previous talks have been given by good friend of mine. So it is a, it's a challenge for me. I, I have many slides. So I will, I will talk fast. And with my Spanish accent, uh, you will have to deduce about 50% of what I, I want to say. <laughs> um, so what I would like to do in the next 45 minutes or so is to give a, a very informal presentation, uh, which I divided in two parts. First, I, I will describe the personal journey that eventually, eventually took me uh, uh, to work on HIV vaccines. And then I will discuss the global effort to develop an HIV vaccine. And I don't pretend in my presentation to give a, a scientific talk, you know, full of data. Rather, I, I want to discuss the human side of how science is done. And I will be happy if at the end of my presentation, you are both inspired and, and informed. Let's start from the very beginning. My personal journey started in Maracaibo, a town on the coast of Lake Maracaibo in Venezuela, where I was born. That's shown, shown in, uh, with the arrow. And the Spanish explorer founded Maracaibo some 500 years ago on the site of an Indian village with houses that were built on the lake. And those houses reminded the Spaniards of Venice. And that, is, uh, that requires a leap of, of imagination. But anyway, that's why they call my country Venezuela. Venezuela, which means little Venice. My, Maracaibo, my city, grew as a prosperous uh, town port in the Caribbean. But being a prosperous city in the Caribbean had problems of its own. In the 17th century, Maracaibo was attacked and burned three times by the pirates of the Caribbean. Perhaps the most famous of those pirates was Henry Morgan, who born, burned the city in 1669. Sir Henry Morgan was an admiral of the British Royal Navy and a hero in England. But for us, he was just a bandit. <laughs> of course, for the Americans of today, Captain Morgan is just the brand name of a run, which I never try actually. So in any case, this is just an example of how there's always, there are always more than one interpretation for every situation. And I, I have lived that situation many times in my professional life. What is right, what is wrong. Maracaibo today is a city of 1.5 million people. And but when I was a kid there, uh, ten years, uh, uh, in that photo I was about 10 years old, uh, the population of Maracaibo was closer to 400,000 uh, inhabitants. And like many kids, I wanted to be a scientist. Uh, specifically, I wanted to be a chemist. But at that time, in Maracaibo, we did not have many choices. And uh, that's how I ended up registering in the local medical school when I was 16 years old. When, when I was a second year medical student, something happened that changed forever my, my future professional career. A major epidemic of Venezuelan equine encephalitis occurred in that part of the country, and I witnessed the devastation that the epidemic caused, especially among the Indians, the aboriginal population, uh, the Guajiros, with 7,000 cases and 43 deaths. And the epidemic, as you can see, also produced encephalitis in horses and in donkeys, and that's why we call the disease equine encephalitis. Um, VEE, or Venezuelan equine encephalitis, is caused by a virus, and the disease has a very complex epidemiology, which is shown in the light of some work, but it's okay. It involves an animal reservoir, a mosquito vector, as well as terminal hosts represented by humans or, or by donkeys or horses. And I was fascinated by, the, by such biological complexity. And at that point, I decided to dedicate my professional career to the study of viruses. As a young medical student, I also had the opportunity to read an extraordinary book entitled Introduction to the Study of Experimental Medicine 
written in 1865 by Claude Bernard. And he, is the, he was the French scientist who is considered the father of physiology. And that book also changed my life because Claude Bernard was a, was a physician, but he never practiced medicine because he felt that science was a more interesting, a challenging career. And I just follow his example. So in 1968, I received my MD diploma, and I was ready to start my formal training as a virologist. Of course, in 1968, we did not know about HIV, which was only discovered 15 years later, in 1983. So one week after finishing medical school, I moved to Caracas, the capital of Venezuela, to work at the Venezuelan Institute of Scientific Research, or, or IVIC, as we know it in Spanish. And IVIC was, at that time, one of the most prestigious research institutes in Latin America. With time, I, I became the chairman of the Center for Microbiology, GDL. Then I started my training under Gernot Bergold in the photo. Bergold was a famous German scientist, expert on insect viruses and electron microscopy. His major contribution was the isolation of baculoviruses that cause disease in silk worm, in insects, in silk worm. He made that discovery in Germany during the 1940s when silk was very important for the war effort because parachutes were made of silk. But that's another story that I don't have time to tell you. But later on, I will tell you how baculoviruses are linked to the HIV vaccine sire. And Pat knows that. Then I went to Baylor College of Medicine in Houston to, to get my PhD. And I went there because Baylor was the only school that had a department that specialized on virology, exclusively on virology. The chairman of the department was Joseph Melnick, one of the pioneers of polio vaccine research. And Joe Melnick had assembled an impressive group of experts uh, working on different areas of virology. And I chose Priscilla Schaefer as my PhD advisor. She was barely four years older than me, and she was started to work on the genetics of herpes viruses. And I found that topic very exciting. Priscilla, uh, who passed away uh, four years ago, eventually moved to Harvard, uh, where she became the world leader on the genetics of, of herpes. So that's me at, at that time, 1970, I guess. So our interest on the herpes viruses, or HSV, uh, as we call them, was because at that time, it was believed that HSV was the cause of cancer of the uterine cervix, you know, cervical cancer. And working on cancer viruses was exciting, and besides, Cervical cancer was and is a public health problem, problem, problem in Latin America. So my work focused on the genetics of HSV, and, and we published, of course, uh, many papers. We were convinced that HSV caused cervical cancer. But as Peter Medawar said in 1979, in a great book that I recommend to all, to all of you, to young people, the book is entitled Advice to a Young Scientist. He said, the intensity of a conviction that a hypothesis is true has no burden over whether it is true or not. And confirming what Peter Medawar said, evidence began to accumulate uh, since 1983, suggesting that HSV was not the cause of cervical cancer. In fact, it was caused, it is caused by certain type of human papilloma virus, or HPV. And that finding eventually led to the development of highly effective preventive HPV vaccine that was approved in, in 2006. So science provided a solution to the cervical cancer problem, the vaccine. But now society has to decide how to use it. And that's not without controversy, but again, this is something that I will not discuss today. In, in any case, in 2008, the Nobel Prize in Medicine was awarded to Harald Surhausen, uh, the German scientist who proved the link between HPV and cervical cancer. And the other two scientists who shared the Nobel Prize the same year were Francois Varese Nuzzi and Luc Montagnier, the French scientists who first isolated HIV uh, because of AIDS. Well, with my PhD, with the PhD in my pocket in 1974, I went back to Caracas and to IDIC, and I decided to focus my research on viral diseases that were important in Venezuela, in my country. Of course, I started to work on Venezuelan acquired encephalitis. 
But something important happened again in 1973 when scientists from Australia, the United Kingdom, and the US reported a new virus associated with gastroenteritis, identified with the electron microscope, is uh, the rotaviruses. Actually, the electron microscopist working with Ruth Bishop in Australia was Jan Holmes. And I knew him from before because he spent a sabbatical year in Caracas at IVIC when I was a young student. And knowing Jan Holmes influenced my decision to shift my laboratory to the study of, of rotaviruses. And after all, gastroenteritis was a major killer of Venezuelan children, and this newly discovered virus could be the solution to the problem. So in 1974, uh, we detected rotaviruses in Venezuela, and we studied their epidemiology, and our work contributed to the acceptance of the rotaviruses as a major cause of severe uh, diarrhea. And I wanted to work on rotavirus vaccines, but at that time, I needed new knowledge and, and better scientific tools. So I decided to spend a sabbatical uh, close to here, I guess, in Durham, in North Carolina, in Duke. And I worked with Bill Joklik, who was a top expert on rheoviruses, which is a family of viruses molecularly related to rotaviruses. Both viruses have double-stranded RNA genome. The molecular biology of rheoviruses was very well known. And I thought that I could rapidly transfer all that knowledge from rheoviruses to the new field of rotaviruses. There in Duke, I upgraded my science and worked on the molecular cloning of uh, rheovirus genes. Then in 1982, I returned to Caracas to continue working on rotaviruses, bringing together clinical aspects, epidemiology, and molecular biology. Although I never developed a rotavirus vaccine myself, I became an expert on, on, on the field. Uh, the development of rotavirus vaccine is a fascinating story in itself, and, and I will not discuss that here. Suffice it to say that after a, a couple of mistakes of faux pas, a safe and effective vaccine, rotavirus vaccine, was finally licensed in 2006, and it is having a significant public health effect as shown in the figure from Mexico, where the vaccine was introduced in 2007. In fact, the, the rotavirus vaccine saga was discussed in this room, I guess, in another lecture of this series by my good friend, uh, Roger Glass, who is currently the Fogarty director at the NIH. So in 1985, the situation in Venezuela was becoming difficult, financially difficult, and I requested a grant from the World Health Organization to study rotaviruses. And to make the long story short, instead of giving my grant, uh, they offered me a job. And that's how I decided to move to Geneva for two years. After all, it, it was a great opportunity to harness science to have a greater impact in developing countries. But instead of two years, I stayed in Geneva for almost 20 years. In, in 86, I joined WHO to work on their program for vaccine development. And another major responsibility I had was the control of viral diseases of epidemic potential. And in December of that year, 1986, I went to Africa for the first time in my life to work on an epidemic of yellow fever in Nigeria that ended up killing 40,000 people. And that epidemic was controlled with a vaccine that was developed back in 1937. And I was familiar with yellow fever because, like Venezuelan encephalitis, yellow fever is a viral disease transmitted by, by mosquitoes in the same family. But again, something unexpected happened. And in 1987, WHO decided to initiate a global program on AIDS under the, the leadership of the late Jonathan Mann. And Jonathan asked me to join the AIDS program and to put together a biomedical research unit to deal with research on diagnostic treatment and vaccines against AIDS. And that's how I shifted again to another virus, HIV, this time. Of course, HIV was the most important virological challenge of modern science, and I was glad to become part of that uh, scientific adventure. With time, the WHO program on AIDS was replaced by the joint United Nations program on HIV AIDS, or UN AIDS, under the, the leadership of Peter Piot, who is currently the director of the London School of Hygiene, of hygiene and Tropical Medicine, or Tropical Medicine and Hygiene, I never know. 
But in UNH, I established the joint WHO uh, UNH HIV vaccine initiative. And the rest of my presentation, I, I will focus on HIV vaccines, which has been my area of concentration during the last uh, uh, 20 years or so. Although HIV vaccines are being developed by many scientists in different laboratories, those vaccines need to be tested in humans. And many of those trials are done in developing countries where the epidemic is worse. So the comparative advantage of WHO was to help those developing countries implementing HIV vaccine trials with the highest scientific and ethical standards. And that was the bulk of my, of my job for, for many years. But after almost 20 years in WHO, in 2004, I moved to the Gates Foundation in Seattle. I was invited by Helene Gale, in the figure, who, in the photo, who was the HIV director at the foundation. And Helene is now the president and CEO of, 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 of CARE, right here in Atlanta. And uh, she was going to be here today, but she had to travel today to somewhere else. And I just had dinner with her last night. Now, vaccines and AIDS were priorities for the Gay Foundation, and they wanted to launch an aggressive program to explore innovative approaches to HIV vaccines. And that's how I moved from Geneva to, to Seattle. In summary, with Helene, we created a novel mechanism to coordinate the big science that is required to develop an HIV vaccine, and we established the Global HIV Vaccine Enterprise, which is currently based in New York. And we also launched in 2006, a massive international research project, the Collaboration for AIDS Vaccine Discovery, or CAVD, which is actually still ongoing. So now I will move to the, to the second part of my talk, which is less autobiographical and more scientific. So the development of an HIV vaccine actually has been discussed in this series of lectures by my friends Andy Groth and uh, Don Francis. But I will take a different approach. My approach will be more historical. And, and here I want to quote the Spanish-born philosopher and writer, George Santayana. He's the one, we all know the sentence, but he's the one who said that those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. And let's start from the very beginning, smallpox. The first vaccine against the smallpox was developed by Edward Jenner in 1796. He noted that milkmaids who had been previously infected with cowpox, a disease from cows, but it's a long story, yeah, were resistant to smallpox. So he speculated that perhaps cowpox protected against smallpox. And to test the hypothesis, he inoculated a child with the cowpox lesions from the hand of a milkmaid. Then, a few days later, Jenner challenged, mean infected the boy with the smallpox and found that the boy was protected. Well, just imagine doing that today. <laughs> but we have to remember that inoculation of smallpox was, at that time, the standard of prevention. Because that way, they avoided more severe cases of the natural infection. But in any case, that was the birth of vaccinology 217 years ago. So vaccination against smallpox was the first, the first vaccine ever. And in 1967, WHO launched uh, the Intensified Smallpox Eradication Program. And thanks to the vaccine, the last case of naturally occurring smallpox happened in Somalia in 1977. And in 1980, WHO declared smallpox eradicated. By the way, the second disease that has been eradicated, that was in, two years ago in 2010, is rinderpest, a viral disease that affected cattle and was also eradicated thanks uh, to a vaccine. So what I will do, uh, with your permission, is to skip the next few slides, which are on polio. Uh, but uh, for the sake of time, I, I just want to, to move to, to this one, where I show a, a description of the history of AIDS, or the period of AIDS, uh, as proposed by, by my former boss, the late Jonathan Mann. And I will focus now in the very last item, the, the development of an HIV vaccine. And when he prepared this slide about 1988, he put a question mark because he didn't know when we would have a vaccine. Now, this slide shows how modern vaccines are developed. It's not like Jenner in 1796. It's a very complex process. 
It starts with basic research to identify the components of the virus to be included in the vaccine. That is followed by extensive animal experiments to test the safety of the vaccine and the ability of that vaccine to induce potentially protective immune responses in animals. In the case of HIV, normally non-human primates, monkeys, and in the past, chimpanzees, not anymore. Then we move to human trials. First, phase one trials in a small number of volunteers, 20 or so, to confirm the safety of the vaccine and the ability of the vaccine to induce immune responses. But finally, vaccine efficacy is defined in large-scale trials enrolling thousands of people, volunteers, healthy volunteers. Typically, half of the volunteers receive the vaccine and the other half receive a placebo. And then we see if the vaccine reduces the incidence of the infection among the vaccinated people. And you can imagine that those are very, very, very complex um, trials. Now, your own <laughs> Pat Thomas wrote back in 2001 a very good book on the history of AIDS vaccines, it's big shots. I read the book at the time, of course, but now I was curious to remind me myself what Pat said about me in the book. <laughs> uh, I guess you see the next slide. Uh, and this is what we say, the developing world's urgent need for a vaccine was articulated by, by Jose Esparza, a Venezuelan physician who headed the HIV vaccine development for the World Health Organization, etc. Although Esparza was officially based in Geneva, he gave the appearance of living on airplanes. And you are contributing to that by bringing me from the theater. And he was, maybe I still, a tousled hair, slump, slightly rumpled figure, had turned up at meetings, vaccine meetings around the world and seemed to know everyone. So now comes the good part. His ability to smooth, synthesize, and help people make deals and connections gave Esparza influence that far exceeded his program small budget. I can tell you that now my budget is bigger. <laughs> uh, and that's me at that time in, in my Geneva office, and uh, that's in the photo, I guess. I was 20 years, uh, and I just, you know, I just laughed because, you know, I, I, I always travel with my hand luggage and the clothing just get uh, uh, like it is now. So, as you know, AIDS was described as a new disease in 1981. Uh, many of you in this room, the young people, were not even born. The virus HIV was isolated in 1983, two years later, by the group of Luc Montagnier in Paris. And in 1984, Bob Gallo provided solid evidence that HIV was the cause of AIDS. And between 1984 and 1986, much was learned about the molecular biology of the virus, the genome, the, the structural proteins. And at the time, we believed that if HIV was a, was a virus like any other virus, a vaccine could be developed quickly. The favorite approach uh, was to make a vaccine based on the envelope of HIV, which is this external part, composed of two proteins, GP120 uh, and GP160. Uh, GP means glycoprotein. And those vaccines would induce neutralizing antibodies capable of killing the virus, just as happens with the majority of the vaccines that, that we have today. So that optimism was expressed in 1984 by the US Secretary of Health and Human Services, Margaret Heckler, which is in the photo with a young Bob Gallo, I guess Margaret Heckler was equally younger. younger. And they predicted, or Margaret Heckler predicted, that a vaccine would be ready for testing in approximately two years. That's in your book. However, as Bob has reminded us several times, they did not promise a vaccine in two years. They only say that a vaccine will be ready for human testing in two years. Um, Now, the prediction of Margaret Heckler became a reality, not because of the good work of the NIH scientists, but because of the audacity of this guy, Daniel Saguri, a Moroccan-born uh, French immunologist, whom in November 1986 started a human HIV vaccine trial in Zaire, in Africa, now it's the Dem Democratic Republic of Congo. And that was the first HIV vaccine trial anywhere in the world. And Daniel Saguri was the first volunteer to ever receive an HIV vaccine. And his vaccine was based on a vaccinia vector, 
which was genetically engineered to express HIV, HIV surface on developed protein, GP160 in this case. And I want to point out that the vaccine vector, you see, that uh, Daniel Saguri used, is the same type of vaccine developed by Edward Jenner in 1796, the vaccine that was used to eradicate smallpox. Saguri also boosted the immune response with soluble GP160, which is the envelope protein, with the goal of inducing both arms of the immune system, humoral antibodies and cell-mediated immunity. Now, we refer to this type of vaccine regime as prime boost. Uh, and as I will discuss in a few minutes, this is the same approach that was used in the RB144 trial that in 2009 showed some protection against HIV among vaccinated volunteers in Thailand. Now, the Saguri trial has almost but disappeared from our collective memory. You ask vaccine scientists, they don't even remember this. Because the trial was conducted without knowledge of the scientific community, it was conducted in children, and, uh, and was using unapproved materials. And, and according to uh, John Cohen, who also wrote another good book on the history of HIV vaccines, this trial put eight vaccine researchers on notice that the ethics of the trial at this stage especially in poor countries, would receive intense scrutiny. And, and that was my job in WHO for many years. Now, the first HIV vaccine trial in the United States started actually in 1988 with a product known as vaccine, a form of GP160 envelope protein produced in a baculovirus system by a company called Microgenesis. So what it did was to insert the HIV gene that calls for the envelope protein into this in vitro expression system, baculovirus or insect cells. And, and you remember that I told you that Gernot Bergot, the German scientist in Caracas, who was one of my first mentors, actually discovered baculoviruses back in, in, in 1943. And when I told him about this research, he was really proud that his virus was helping in the development of, of an HIV vaccine. Uh, by the way, uh, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, FDA approved the first recombinant influenza vaccine produced in paculoviruses. It's the first time in... Uh, now, let me review with this slide what we are trying to do with vaccines. We, we try to induce humoral immunity, meaning antibodies that bind to the virus particle and kill, kill the virus. The envelope vaccines are great for that approach. And this is the type of mechanism that operates with most existing vaccines. The other type of immune response is cellular aim at inducing what we call cytotoxic T cells are cells that recognize and kill virus infected cells. And those two arms of the immune system have defined the different scientific paradigms that have guided HIV vaccine research over the years. Now, this slide shows different type of potential HIV vaccines. So at the bottom here, we have whole inactivated or live attenuated uh, uh, vaccines which are used for many other diseases. But in the case of HIV, we, we, we prefer not to use those approaches because of the risk involved. So uh, most of the vaccines that have been developed are based on recombinant proteins uh, produced in, in, in the laboratory. Uh, in, that, in that way, we, we are absolutely sure that vaccination will not induce AIDS. Uh, and most of the vaccines are based on the envelope protein of the virus produced by recombinant technology. But it's a problem with envelope-based vaccines. HIV is genetically very variable, and the envelope gene is the most variable. So in fact, different subtypes of HIV are classified based on the genetic distance of their envelope genes. And we refer to these subtypes with the letters of the alphabet. And those subtypes have characteristic geographic distributions, with subtype C been the most frequent in the world, particularly in Southern Africa, uh, and so type B is the most prevalent in the United States. So in collaboration with Saladinus Manoff, who is now in CDC in Atlanta, but he couldn't come today, we conducted, conducted numerous studies to understand the distribution of HIV subtypes in the world. But there are critical questions for which we still don't have clear answers. What is the relationship of the genetic variability of HIV with potential immunological variability? So what is the relevance of the HIV subtypes for vaccine-induced protection? But we don't know, but in any case, the current paradigm is that vaccines 
should match the subtypes of the circulating strain. And there is an enormous effort to develop the type C vaccines for use in Southern Africa. So this slide summarizes the, the three paradigms that have guided HIV vaccine development since 2008. The first paradigm explore, focus on the use of envelope proteins to induce neutralized antibodies. The second paradigm explore the induction of cell-mediated immunity using DNA vaccination and different vectors, such as, as small pulse vectors and others. And the third paradigm is exploring different combinations of more complex immune responses. So I, 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 as discussed before, the smallpox vaccine and unrelated viruses are favorite vectors for HIV vaccines. And J.P. Pantaleo in the photo from Lausanne in Switzerland is probably the leader in this area. But another virus that has been used to vector or to carry HIV genes are different type of adenoviruses. And that Dan Baruch from Harvard has recently produced exciting data on animal experiments, especially when he combined vaccination with pox and adenoviruses. So this slide uh, shows the variety of vaccine approaches that has been used in the 218 HIV vaccine clinical trials conducted since 1988. And we don't have time to discuss this in detail, but enough is to say that the majority of these trials involve different combinations of prime and boost vaccination. So there was a lot of new science produced in the 1990s, and that created excitement in the field. Uh, in fact, in May 18, 1997, a commencement speech at Morgan State University in Baltimore, President Clinton challenged the US scientists to develop an HIV vaccine within the next decade. And he was emulating actually President Kennedy's challenge to put a man on the moon before the end of the 1960s. Well, the first signal of an effective vaccine was obtained in 2009, 12 years after the Clinton challenge, which is not too far from the original 10 years uh, target. But, but that was only a first signal of efficacy, not, not a practical vaccine. Uh, as I mentioned before, vaccines are developed not only in the laboratories, but also in countries where trials are conducted. And that's not without tensions. And this slide shows the media reaction to a proposed trial in Uganda in 1996. And I, I was in the middle of that. The actual trial in Uganda actually started in 1999, three years later. Uh, and I took a lot, it took a lot of negotiations where NIH and UNH play an important role. And this is a then and now photo with Bonnie Matheson, who, who now leads the HIV vaccine effort at the NIH Office of Health Research. Uh, and this travel is why I give the parents of living on, on, on airplanes. So in 2001, we dropped the creation of the African AIDS vaccine program to provide a strong, strong African voice for the complicated process of conducting vaccine trials in the continent. And Ponciano Calibu from Uganda has been one of the driving forces. In Brazil, we were initially accused of asking Brazilians to serve as guinea pigs for American investigators. In fact, I was mentioned to them this morning, in that opportunity, I was even expelled from the country by the Minister of Health. He asked me to leave the country in 24 hours. But with education, dialogue, and a lot of patience, we managed to obtain the support from the affected community, and trials were eventually conducted in, in Brazil. And the initial situation was not better in Thailand. Where, where we, found, we found a lot of hostility, as you can see in the cartoon. But with time, Thailand became one of the leaders on HIV vaccines, and they have conducted two of the four efficacy trials that have been done, including the RD144 trial that I will discuss in a minute. So what we have learned from those 218 phase one, phase two trials, well, we have learned that the vaccines are safe. And, and we have learned that they induce different type of and levels of anti-HIV immune response, tumor, or cellular. We have also learned that some vaccines protect monkeys from infection with the simian immunodeficiency virus, or SIV, is a monkey equivalent of HIV. But the only way to learn if the vaccines protect humans against HIV infection or disease is by conducting large-scale phase 2B or phase 3 efficacy trials. And 
Although more than 200 small-scale trials have been conducted, only four efficacy trials have been implemented. And uh, they are listed here. And those efficacy trials are multi-year trials with thousands of participants. And, and the date shown is the, when we obtain the results. This slide provides more information about these trials and also include the only efficacy trial currently being conducted in North America and one that is being planned uh, for Southern Africa. Now, the results from the first two efficacy trials were known in 2003. VACGEM tested two envelope GP120 vaccines, one in 2,500 volunteers in the United States using a subtype B vaccine, you know, the subtype prevalent in North America, and the other trial in 4,500 injecting drug users in Thailand using a subtype E vaccine, because that's the vaccine that is prevalent in Thailand. Actually, it's a combination E and B. Now, Don Francis in the photo, and he was actually one of your speakers here, was the driving force of the trials. And in the photo in the middle is, uh, I, is in, in one of our many planning meetings that we have in Thailand. And this was a very controversial uh, trial, and, and many scientists expected a failure, which it was, it, it was a failure. In 2003, we learned that the vaccine was not effective. So this was the major first setback in the field of HIV vaccines. And this setback led to, led to rethinking of our strategy and how, and to the proposal for the creation of the global HIV vaccine enterprise. This is after your book, which I mentioned in one of my previous slides. And this proposal was made by 22, 23 people. I, I was one of the co-authors. And we propose a new way to collaborate, harnessing science to accelerate the development of an HIV vaccine. And in 2005, the enterprise developed a scientific and a strategic plan to describe how the major players would collaborate. And Helene was a major inspiration on this process. I don't know what time it is. I don't have a watch. Yeah. 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 And the photo shows the small enterprise secretariat is in New York now. Now, let's go back to to trials. The results from the second phase three efficacy trial came in 2007. And that vaccine was based on an adenovirus vector manufactured by Merck. And the trial was known as the STEP trial. Well, the vaccine not only failed to protect against HIV, but in fact, the vaccine enhanced HIV acquisition in vaccinated volunteers who had existing antibodies against the adenovirus vector. So it was a catastrophe. Uh, a parallel trial in South Africa, known as Pambili, was also stopped. And I don't have time to discuss this trial, but the net effect was the scientific community reacted with the notion that we do not know how to make an HIV vaccine, and that we have to go back to do more basic science before conducting more large-scale efficacy trials. However, the fourth efficacy trial was already underway since 2003 in Thailand. And we call it the RD144 trial. And this slide shows the major drivers of the trial in Thailand and the US. It was a trial uh, sponsored by, by, by the uh, good colleagues from the US Army. Um, Nelson Michael and Jerome Kim. And the PI of the trial was Dr. Supashai and Dr. Pudin. The trial was a real partnership between Americans and Thai investigators. And it enrolled 16,000 healthy Thai volunteers. The vaccine use was a prime boost regime, very similar to the one used in 1986 by Daniel Saguri in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Volunteers were primed with a canary pox, which is a pox virus related to vaccinia, a canary pox recombinant vaccine. And then the boost was the same GP120, the same envelope that has failed to protect when used alone in the vaccine trial. And the goal was, like Saguri in 1986, to induce both humoral and cell mediated immunity. Uh, Pages are stuck here. Now, this slide shows that during the first six months of the trial, volunteers received, received six shots 
of the prime Bush regime. Uh, uh, and they were followed for two and a half years. Half of the volunteers received the vaccine, half of the volunteers received a placebo, and all the volunteers received risk reduction counseling. Uh, so to be sure that we don't we decrease the opportunities for them to be exposed to HIV. And they were bled every six months and tested for HIV. So these are, these are the results that were announced in, and published in the New England Journal of Medicine in November 2009. People receiving the vaccine had less HIV infections than the control. And the effect of, of the vaccine was more marked in the first few months of the infection before one year of the vaccination. But in summary, the vaccine was found to have an efficacy of 31%, 31.2%. However, cat modest efficacy is not enough to use the vaccine in public health programs. Modeling showed that we need at least 50% efficacy before we use the vaccine in public health. But as I said before, the efficacy was higher, actually closer to 60% during the first year after vaccination. And that observation suggests that a more potent vaccine perhaps can protect people for longer periods of time. And that is the research that we are currently doing. Now, oh, it's 60%. Now, this is a complicated slide, but a, a very important one. After we learned that the vaccine used in the RD144 trial conferred protection, a, the scientific com community mounted an unprecedented collaborative effort to try to identify immune correlates of protection. Or in other words, what type of vaccine induced, vaccine induced immune response may have been responsible for the observed protection. So samples from presumably protected and unprotected volunteers were extensively, uh, extensively analyzed and compared. Uh, and the results were published actually in New England Journal of Medicine in May, in May of uh, 2012. So one immune response gave a positive signal of correlation. And it was an antibody response to one part of the HIV envelope that we refer to as the V2 loop. Uh, and unfortunately, I, I, we don't really have time to discuss the results. Su suffice to say that the field is using this information to, to try to increase the protective efficacy of improved next generation uh, vaccines. This, is, this photo was taken during a meeting in Bangkok where the immune correlate data was presented. And this slide shows some of the people who collaborated with Thai investigators in the RD144 trial and, and, uh, and the many vaccine trials that have been conducted in Thailand since 1994. It was one of those rare moments of optimism. So the next slide, I have to show it. I have to show the photo because I'm very proud of this. In that meeting uh, in Bangkok, uh, the Princess Sirin Horn gave me a plaque in recognition of, of the many years I've been working in Thailand supporting the, their effort. People ask me, how do you get to, how, how, what, what do you have to do to get a plaque from, from the princess? She may be the, the queen. Next. And I said, well, it's very easy. You have to work in Thailand and keep doing it for 25 years. Yeah. Um, and I also have to show this slide. Uh, together with Don Francis and, and two esteemed Thai colleagues, uh, Dr. Uh, Puni and Professor Prasset, we edited in, in 2006 a book summarizing the effort of and commitment of Thailand uh, to develop an HIV vaccine. And that's what it takes, patient, persistent collaboration and commitment. And I should have used a more recent photo of myself there, yeah, but that's OK. So in summary, why it has been so difficult to develop an HIV vaccine? Well, first of all, HIV integrates in the host cell genome. Once it's there, it's there forever. You cannot get rid of it. It's like diamonds are forever. Second, there is no known natural protective immune response against HIV. People infected with HIV remain infected for life. So a vaccine has to be better than nature, have to, be, have to induce an immune response that nature has not learned how to develop. Third, as I mentioned, we don't have correlative protection. We don't know what type of immune response we want to induce or protect. It's humoral, cellular, mucosal, we don't know that. 
And in fact, although I didn't discuss that, RB144 actually told us that perhaps protection was not because of neutralizing antibodies, but against a new type of antibodies that have functions different from neutralization. And until that moment, we even didn't suspect that this type of immune response could, could actually protect against HIV infection. The other problem we have is the virus variability and, and mutational escape. So we may need actually vaccines for different geographical parts of the world. Uh, again, I don't have time to discuss, but uh, antibodies, broadly neutralizing antibodies, can actually develop in humans who are infected with HIV, but it takes two years. It's what we call a process of affinity maturation. But the antibodies evolve to a way that actually are broadly neutralizing. We just, we know that humans can do that, but we don't know how to induce that with a vaccine. And the other problem that we have is that uh, the animal models that we have, monkeys, are not fully predictive. So at the end of the day, we have to do human trials. So what is next? So we need to improve the RD144 regime. And this has been done through a major collaborative effort that we call the P5, it's the Pox Virus uh, Protein Public-Private Partnership. In addition, based on recent knowledge about the structure of the HIV envelope, uh, new vaccines are being designed that are capable of inducing neutralizing or otherwise protective immune response uh, antibodies. And we are also de developing novel uh, replicating vectors that may be more effective than the replication defective pox or uh, adenovectors that we are using now. But more importantly, I want to say that we will never give up because we believe that a vaccine is absolutely necessary to stop the AIDS epidemic, especially in the poorest countries of the world. And many thanks for your attention and patience. Well, to some extent, we are fortunate that there are many ways to prevent new infections with HIV. We have condoms, we have microbicides, we have behavioral interventions, we have a treatment for prevention. I mean, you can actually provide an uninfected person drugs, and those drugs will prevent the infection of that person. Or, very important, if we actually treat people who are HIV infected, the, 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 the virus load will decrease to a point that that person will, will not be able to transmit the virus to others. So we have an arsenal of possibilities of interve preventive interventions, and they all have to be used in combination. And in some populations, you can use a combine a menu. If you have a menu, you have to use every element of the menu. That, but in some, in some locations where it's difficult to reach, I mean, remember, antiretrovirals also um, induce resistance to antiretrovirals. So we may actually lose the value of antiretrovirals very soon. They are toxic, in, well, sort of toxic, every time less toxic. They are, they are still expensive. So, it, I, but I do agree with you that some people believe that maybe with all of those other preventive interventions, we may not need a vaccine. And this is a historical mistake. But that, that, that's a problem I would like to have in the future when we have a vaccine. But I can tell you, most vaccines, the public health use of most vaccines is when you give the vaccine to everybody. Because once you start defining that, that this population will receive the vaccine in this population or that population, you stigmatize the population immediately. So that's a tricky question on how to use a vaccine once we have. It will depend on the target product profile. It will depend on how many doses we require. It will depend on the cost of the vaccine. I, 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 I think that to answer your question, we, I don't have the, 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 the answer now, but the gut feeling is that the ideal vaccine is the one that will give to everybody uh, a birth so, when they are very young. Oh, because GP120 is the most outer envelope protein. It's the one that is, is exposed. So that's the protein that has two important functions. It's the protein that the virus uses to bind target cells. So you, you can actually block that. And also, is the protein that induces, uh, is the most potent inducer of neutralizing antibodies. So GP120 is, is the idea. But it's not the only one. I mean, there is recent data suggesting that GP41, which is the second, the other half of, of, of the envelope protein, also have conserved epitopes 
that may actually be used on, on a vaccine. But in any case, if you want to develop a vaccine that induces antibodies, you have to use either GP120, GP160, uh, or GP41, or modification of those two envelope proteins. Yeah. Actually, I was in the, when, when you do a trial, you organize what we call a data and safety monitoring board. It's a group of people who actually have access to the data and, and monitor the progress of the trial. I, I was a member of that ESMB of the IP144. And I can tell you, and I was mentioned that to them today, that we were very excited when we opened the code. And we only knew that, I mean, nobody else. I, I can say that now because just after the fact. But, uh, and, and we saw protection. We were very excited. And then when we, up, we, we did analysis after that, we see the losing the protection. So what happened is now is that those immune responses that we believe um, um, uh, are associated with protection, uh, the durability is very short. And in fact, if you vaccinate a human with GP160, you see this peak of antibodies and very quickly come down. That's one of the major problems that we have on, on malaria also, but the HIV is, 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 is the worst case, where the, the longevity of the immune memory is, is very short. So we don't know how to solve that problem. One possibility is using a better adjuvant, that, so they, to increase the, the level of antibody response, and then hopefully, I mean, you may not increase the longevity, but if you have the level is higher, it will take longer to decay to a point that is not protected anymore. The other possibility is multiple boosts. But, uh, but the more boosts you need, the less practical the vaccine is for public health programs. So it's, it's the duration of the immune response. The antibodies just wane very quickly. And we don't know why. It depends on the population. And the 50% actually came from modeling work done in Thailand. So the Thais were preparing themselves to make a decision if once, once they knew the results, if they will use the vaccine or not. So they, they did the modeling, the cost benefit of using a vaccine. And that's how, and I'm, not, I'm not a mother, so I cannot give you a lot of details of that. But just linking your question with your question, they model the use of a vaccine basically to prevent male-to-male -male transmission. And, and in fact, the Thais were thinking about targeting the, the vaccine to some specific populations. So a vaccine with 50% may not be cost efficient if it's used in a population where the incidence on infection is very low. So it, you, your question is very important, and it will have to be modeled situation by situation. Now, I, actually, they, they, last year, the Journal of Vaccine published a series of modeling work and in fact, they concluded that in countries with high prevalence, a high incidence of HIV infection, even a vaccine that is 30% effective will be cost efficient. So it will depend on the epidemiological situation. Yeah. Now, there is a, a, but please don't tell that to anybody, but most people believe that vaccines are 100% safe and 100% effective, which is not true. Any medical intervention has some risk. Vaccines have some risk. And no vaccine is 100% effective. So the, the decision that the public health community have to, to make is what level of efficacy. You know, the flu vaccine that we, we use, I mean, the seasonal flu vaccine, is about 60% effective. But that 60% effective has an impact, a personal impact, because it protects you from disease. And also, there is a concept called herd immunity. So a vaccine that is not highly effective if using large number of uh, the, the population can actually protect the population to a level that is higher than the one predicted by the vaccine efficacy. That's, that's the case of cholera, for instance. When you use a, a vaccine against cholera that has 40% eff efficacy in a population, you actually, the, the net benefit is more than 40%, because basically you eliminate infect, infectious people from the pool. So there is a, 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 an extra benefit when you vaccinate the, the population. 